Hello, I would like to share a little bit of my process. So I just fired up GitHub today and I was going to start making some edits to a little web page script thing that I've been working on. And I thought, why not just show my process? Share it. It might be boring to some people, but maybe for just a few people, it might be slightly interesting. I'm sort of in the early, I'm in the middle of it, but it's the early, early middle of this little project here. So what's going on is I'm working on this table of, uh, if you're not familiar at Tech Career Growth in their Slack channel, they have um, some people anonymously volunteer compensation data at tech companies. And so that goes gets pasted into this table right here and it's just a markdown table on github and it's basically kind of like a uh, just like an excel spreadsheet sort of or google sheet spreadsheet whatever you want to think of it as sort of being like but the thing is is since it's in markdown it's static and you can't like click a table heading and reorganize anything by that and the order I have it here I don't even have it alphabetized by company or anything over here I just as new data comes in I just sort of edit this file and paste it in like this one just happens to be the last data point that was offered up in the channel so just coincidentally it's a Z but it's not in you can see here's C and then there's an S or whatever and down here, this just explains um, what some of the headings, what some of the columns are. So what the stock options, like this is basically saying take 10% of your salary and you can turn around and apply that towards stock purchases at a 15% discount, for example. Um, the data really isn't standardized too well in here, as you can tell. So anyway, instead of worrying too much about that, I guess like one of the things I did is like if it unless otherwise noted it's in US dollars even if it's a foreign country it's been converted to US dollars for like compensation details and stuff like that but also when somebody has given a foreign currency I tried to include that as well leave it included like that and the reasoning I was thinking behind that is that the you know, currency versus currency changes slightly, at least, all of the time, right? So if somebody's getting paid so many francs or rupees or whatever their currency is against a U.S. dollar, if we convert it to a U.S. dollar, yeah, when they got that offer, that was worth such and such U.S. dollars, but they'll continue to be paid in that currency in another country, regardless of its value, for the most part, against the U.S. dollar, right? So by noting that other currency it's like this is basically like a, a convenience conversion for us that are used to us dollars and then this is their actual payment that they'll steadily receive so in the future one thing i might do is go in and make it so that optionally it will go fetch the current value of the us dollar against that and then convert it to show it maybe I don't know. I haven't thought too far into that, but that's my reasoning in leaving these uh, foreign currency types of symbols in there and whatnot. And then some of the data points are missing, whatever. I'm just kind of mentioning these because they can be something that in the future, trying to standardize stuff or getting data from people, making sure to like emphasize like hey can you make sure if there's a 401k or whatever to include that because they might forget i've noticed that pretty much 401k i guess is just a u.s thing or maybe u.s canada and europe if even that but i've only noticed it specifically in the u.s all these other places don't have it but yeah so that's that so that's that data i just put it in here just to get a chart going you know just to kind of get it off the ground so to speak you know just hash something out and get it in front of me where i could view it because all this was sort of entered into little posts in that channel so i extracted that data where as you can see it's easy to copy and paste do whatever so if we go over here and look at it in sort of like the raw form this is what the markdown looks like 
So you, this is your header right here. It's just plain text file, right? And so these are your column names. And then here's like one record, one row. And instead of, you might've heard obviously of a CSV file, a comma separated value or tab separated or whatever type of value file. This one just happens to be pipe separated, but otherwise it's effectively like a CSV file, right? So noting that, and then here's all the stuff. And then there's just a single dash if there's no data point. Um, and then down here, these little things correspond to these guys up here. And what the GitHub rendering does is it turns it into a little uh, superscript hyperlink. So if we click that, it will shoot us down. Oh, wow, I didn't even realize it put a box around it. Yeah, it will shoot us down here and say, hey, there's what you're looking at. And then if you hit the return thing, I guess it just takes you back up here. Well, what I did is I created a web page anyway that basically is the same thing. Here's the same data dumped into a web page effectively. So there's the GitHub, you know, just viewing the markdown file, this markdown file right here with that single table with the little legend at the bottom. And then we come over here and, you know, here's effectively the table, right? And then the legend at the bottom. So Roughly pretty close. I also lifted um, some of the formatting from the GitHub. I just come over here and when you're on a page, you can hit like control shift I, or you can right click the page and hit um, inspect right there. And that will bring up these handy dandy little tools. Sorry if the font's a little small. So this console, this is a JavaScript console primarily, and all these little errors and notes and whatever stuff going on is to do with GitHub. This is on their page. That's pretty common on a lot of sites. But if we come over here to the inspector, which is more of the HTML stuff, I'll just click on this little deal right here. And once it turns blue, we can come up here and highlight anything we want. So we'll just highlight like, you can see it's a slightly different color for this row. So I'll highlight that. And then it picks it down here. We'll just go ahead and click on this table row tag to kind of better focus it. And then you can see over here you have your uh, your styling. And this is computed, I guess. There's I didn't realize the columns can vary in here, of course. So over here we can see that we can uncheck background color. And then if you watch up here as I check and uncheck it, the background color is appearing and disappearing in case you're not too familiar with those tools. Well, what's going on there is this, uh, this is what's being applied to it right here. It's saying, you know, every nth child alternate the color. And that's what gives it that nice, slightly grayer color there to make it a little easier on the eye to scan across there. So what I did is I just came in here and like, on my deal over here, I just came in and like their uh, font in particular here. I'll open up the view source. I'm right clicking and uh, where's view source at? Yeah, view page source. So right here, you know, it's a regular old HTML file. There's the header and the title. This brings in a the Google icons. I wanted those basic icons across the top right here. So those are that's what that line's bringing in. And then here's just some static styling for CSS in the header and we've got the body here and we're doing font family all this stuff and I just lifted that over here from if we look at font family right here you can see Apple blah 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 Helvetica Sego UI sans serif all that stuff and that's what I just copied that line straight in there so that gives me the same font otherwise I think it defaults to like a times font which has a little serif those little fancy edges on it, which is supposedly harder to read on screen. So I went ahead and just lifted that so that it would be like a sans serif font, which is supposedly easier to read on screen. Couldn't tell a whole lot of difference with this table in particular, but in general, that seems to be the case. I went ahead and copied their padding for the table data cells and uh, for the table row, I just have a black or no, that's a white background color. And then on the even, every even child, I set it to a slightly lighter, or excuse me, a slightly darker color. And that's where you get this effect. So I guess this is counted as the, in my case, this is counted as the 
the first row, and then this is the even one that's slightly darker than the second one, or the third one actually is lighter again. So that's what's going on there. So that's where I'm at with things basically. And what I wanna do is just start making minor incremental changes to improve this. So one of the first things I notice as I come down here that really continues to catch my eye, since I don't really have, I haven't really bounced this specific part of this project off of anybody yet. I have shown people this table and I didn't hear any specific complaints yet. But uh, so, so far I only have my own personal viewpoint to go by. So I want to get it to like a certain base quality, like minimum viable product kind of a status before I present it. And um, so I want to, I want to clean up a, a few of the rough edges. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to kind of show like at least make it so that okay if i were to show it right now i feel like maybe if somebody really drilled in like i'd expect they would probably mention these kind of things and it won't take me too much time it shouldn't take me too much time to go ahead and refactor my code and stuff these little additions into it so what i want to do is something i basically i have the original github as a reference there that they have these little hyperlink deals there i can go ahead and Hit the inspect on one of those maybe. And then we can see down here, it's a super script, this little tag, which is supposedly supported since Firefox 1. So, you know, more or less the past two decades, that tag's been supported according to the Mozilla MDN site and the W3 schools, I believe. So, but I have found in both of those situations where they've been wrong about how far back the uh, tag support or whatever features in the browsers go. But anyway, it seems like it supposedly goes back pretty far. So otherwise another option would be you can use CSS and you can do a couple lines of CSS and effectively create a superscript like that. But since this supposedly goes back that far and it's a lot easier than the CSS, I'll probably just end up going that route. And Less is more, I feel like, when it comes to code. And so, yeah, that's what I'll go with. And then you can see inside of there, there's an anchor. Not that that anchor is totally necessary at this point, but at least if I can get the superscript so that it's not taking up this fat chunk of, you know, it almost just looks like garbage on the line. It doesn't even make sense. Like, what's that? That's some weird code symbols that slip through. Okay, so here's the code. Like I said, this is basically the header data for just a standard English UTF-8 HTML file. There's that Google um, fonts link, and here's the styling. For the CSS, we're styling the body tag, we're styling the table, and then that's the table borders as a whole, and here's the table row, table row evens, and each table cell giving some padding around the text so that's what you know so that this isn't closed in tight these boxes aren't there's a little bit of breathing room around everything like i said that's basically lifted directly from here okay and i do everything as i start out i don't use frameworks um like arguably this is typically about as far as i'll go with a, any sort of a bringing in additional stuff and that, that's actually more like just a font library than it is a framework because it's not dictating the layout or the architecture of my code so much only in the most minimal ways excuse me um yeah so i'll i'll just go raw you know raw css raw html raw javascript i lean towards javascript es3 because especially in the front end um there's still a lot of browsers out there that don't have good compatibility. And even if it's just one culprit, like if it's Microsoft Internet Explorer, which still, uh, it's too bad, it's still installed in a lot of institutions and stuff like that. So there's certain things I can't, like even, I don't even think Internet Explorer ever supported the for of loop in JavaScript, for example. So Whenever I'm on the fence about that, it's like, well, just go with the traditional for loop. It's going to be faster anyway, so that's good. It's just a little bit less readable, a little bit more code, but um, 
knowing that it's enough for me to justify just going with an old school for loop that will work in any situation that pretty much that any of those other for loops will work in. So yeah, that's that header. And then we get down here and we enter the body of the HTML. And I just stuck in a regular old div. I think I'd remember trying to uh, do a table before and then dynamically filling in the details of the table and I was having trouble. So this time I was just like, forget it, I'll just do a div. So that's why, that's my reasoning behind that. And then I've got this script, pair of script tags down here at the very bottom of body, which is at least in a more substantial of a page, a more contentful page. That's the idea is you want to try and stuff as much of your scripts processing towards the bottom of the page so that something gets rendered before it starts processing all those scripts potentially. Um, this is kind of a little bit ghetto-ish where I have like this uh, load table and then I have a function right below it called load table. I think I'd lifted this from the just the basic template few lines of code for a Ajax request from W3 schools probably so I decided to just leave the function and um, just call it and in JavaScript of course you have hoisting so you can declare the function after the call and that's fine because it it knows about it and so we come in here we make the Ajax request which is just we set it up anyway we set up a we request a new re, uh, object for an Ajax request which is asynchronous JavaScript and XML um, XML in this case really just being the markdown. Sometimes I will be like raw HTML too. Um, and then right here, what we have is this callback function for once it does fetch that data, it's going to call this function and execute it. So that's just defined there. Um, I could actually it would probably actually make more sense in JavaScript to define it after this stuff right here. So I could and this sets up the call. This actually opens the just using a standard get request. That's like the simplest form of an HTTP call. And then it's going to call this address, which is going to basically come over here. And it's going to uh, access this table, but it's this raw link. If I click this, then you can see there's this raw GitHub user content thing. Um, it's pretty much the same exact link as the rendered markdown, but it but just this part right here has changed this um just that stuff's changed right there. But that will effectively give us the raw markdown file instead. So that's what I'm I'm doing here is I'm just requesting that raw markdown file. Um it's running asynchronous in the background, and then this actually just calls it which I might be able to tack on a send at the end of that. If this actually returns a reference to itself, I could do that. But anyway, just a thought. So maybe one thing I'll try just to show like a minor change is I'll try cutting this out and I'll bring it up here and I'll put it all right here. Let's see what we want that lined up with that. Yeah, all that like that. Okay, and since this is a function, I'll give it some space there. And I'll save that. And so now if I go to the command prompt in that directory on my local dev machine folder, which just happens to be right here, I can look at the files there. This is my file, right? This is not the markdown, obviously. This is that HTML file that I'm working on right here which is effectively this one on the second tab over here. And so if I do a git diff, I can see what changes I've made. And we're seeing some additions where I basically cut that out and moved it up here. And that's it. So that's one atomic change. Ideally, that's pretty much what you want a commit to look like. At least there's sort of like the the downstream developer commits and there's the upstream macro commits um so for my personal situation i would want it this granular of commits but as i make it 
like if there was an upstream re repo that I was pushing this to, that especially if it wasn't mine, if it was like a more of a public type of a project or something, which mine is open source and public, but it's not like a big well-known product project like Node.js or something, right? In that case, I'd want to squash all those commits into one. So anyway, and then just name that one thing. If I had done like one more conceptual change, but that's getting a little bit out there on a limb. Okay, so if I do a git status, I can see that I have, I'm not tracking that file. So if I were to try and make a commit, then nothing would effectively happen because there's no files being tracked. This one's showing us that this file is in fact modified. So it probably is a good candidate to be tracked. So what we can do is do an um, git add and you can do, you know, I could do star.html or whatever, anything that will grab that file. And since that's the only file in this directory that's modified, I can just do a single dot, which represents, you know, basically anything in this folder track the files in this folder that have changed and uh, yeah now if I do a git status then we can see now it's green it's modified and it's tracking it it's staged for a commit okay so we should test that I haven't tested that so what I'll do is I'll test that in Firefox and you can see right here it's using the file protocol so to speak and the way this one works is that's the protocol. And then this third slash effectively is like the root folder, which is kind of confusing on Windows because we don't normally use that. So that's sort of just the convention of what's going on there. Not pertinent information right at this point. But here's that changed file. We can go ahead and view the source to make sure that we are looking that I saved that change before I previewed it. And we can see up here, I, oh yeah, all the way up here, a little bit harder without the syntax highlighting. So right there, I have the open and the send moved up there and it's still, it's pretty quick. I'm not using some of the more modern methods of like web sockets or anything like that, because this is really pretty simple on its own and it has a pretty good backward compatibility, you know, like plus or minus 15 years with any browser, I'd say. So that's just the route I'm going. All right, and you saw that loaded pretty quick. This literally, even though I'm running it locally, it pulled in all that data for that table from uh, the GitHub site. You know, it went and fetched that file. I can hit Control F5 and it's like that. Like that quick, it's going and fetching all that data processing all that JavaScript and rendering the page. So that's one of the reasons I like to avoid frameworks is it's just keeps things easier in light speed. Okay, so that works. That's committed. Now, if I look with this git status here, it says use git push. Use git push to publish your local commit. So these changes are only on my machine at this point. So if I go back over here, if I go to uh, git And then, which repository is that? Go in here. If we look at the history, the last, the last commit was 18 hours ago. So add icons to table headers was the last commit that I pushed upstream. Oops. Um, so if we look at this compensation file upstream, we can see that it still has this open and send way down below. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll come over here and we'll do a git. Well, what we should do is just like if there were multiple people working on this repository, we could skip this step and it would just complain to us, but what we'd want to do just for illustration is do a git pool. And then I always do a rebase because that gets rid of that merge commit if there just is best avoided in most circumstances, I think. So git pool, rebase, and if there were any changes, 
your index contains uncommitted changes. So it's saying, hey, even if there are upstream changes, we can't pull those in because you have, uh, you know, you have changes that aren't committed to that repo. So what we can do is we can do a git stash. And a git stash is like, there's basically like this stack, this invisible stack, and we're going to throw all of our stuff over into it right now, all of our changes. Saved working directory and index state work in progress on main, refactor CSS. Um, so now if we do a git status, we can see your branch is ahead of origin by one command, blah, blah, blah. I guess that's not too detailed. Let's see if I'm doing this right. So let's do a git pull rebase to pull in any potential changes, which I don't think there should be any, but just in case. Current branch is up to date. But if it wasn't in that case, it would have pulled in the changes without conflict yet um, because my changes wouldn't have been factored in. Shouldn't have been anyway. So then I can do a git, I think it's a stash pop. Um, changes not staged, what will be committed, no changes. I'm kind of wondering if I did that right now. So uh, git stash, I haven't done that in a minute. That's one thing I don't like about git is it's like, it's weird. Yeah, git stash pop. So that should have popped it, but then I guess it unstaged the changes. I'm not going to read all this right now. Remove a single stash state from the stash list applied on top of the current working tree. Do not inverse operation in the working directory. Applying the state can fail. Okay, anyway, let's see what. So I guess it just unstages my stuff. So I can go ahead and say git add that and then check the status again. And now it's all ready. So now I can do a uh, git. Oh, I guess I never did commit it. That's right. I was confused about that. So what change did we make? Ooh, that's scary. Did it not? Okay. Let's do a... Uh... Let's look at this file that it gave us. I oh, just dumped it into a regular old editor. So the open and send are there. So it's still preserved those changes. So that's okay. I just want to make sure it didn't give me like a super old copy. Okay, so programmer's notepad is saying that something happened here. I'm just going to save it over itself since nothing new was brought in. Okay, let's do a git status. Um, git add, and then git status, okay, do a git commit, and then this one was, what we can do is git diff, and this one shouldn't show us anything, because now the changes are staged, so what we have to do to access those is do a git diff cached, and then we can check in that staged area for what the diff is. Okay, this is what it is so that we can get an idea of what to title it, or I can get an idea of what to title it. So this is just refactoring Ajax uh, statements. So I can say git commit minus message refactor Ajax. like that and then better to err towards checking the status too many times and it looks like all we need to do now is a git push to send it back upstream so that's done git status should say there's nothing going on everything's good and then i can go over here and refresh this and now we can see the last commit was 26 seconds ago. Refactor Ajax statements, it's there. And 
double checking in the source code itself. There it is above the callback function. All right. And because I manually tested it in theory with this simple program, it should be okay. All right. So that's covers how I usually go about making a commit, pushing it upstream, all that kind of stuff. Then what I do is I come in here. Well, Actually, maybe I'll break up this video and I'll just leave that at that. And in the next video, what I'll do is I'll come in here and work on that actual changing this stuff. So thanks for watching so far.